Welcome to Calvary, where we praise the Lord. You know that you're tuned in to the right station, where we praise the Lord. Preachers will be preaching, sisters are ready to shout, yeah, choir will be singing. We're so glad you came out. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, praise the Lord. Wake up to Calvary. I've been tick and trying to spread the word of God and there's so many souls to save so you know I'm never stopping. I've been straight praying, I ain't playing. I'm just saying God forgives me for my sins and he keeps the blessings praying. Greetings and God bless you. Welcome to Calvary Socially Distanced Worship. Look, we're not trying to recreate some in-person uh, worship service by going into the sanctuary and putting on some songs and, and doing a sermon. We wanted to create a worship experience here at Calvary based on where we are right now. And so I hope you enjoy it as the members of Calvary come together and worship socially distanced style. So stay tuned, join in with us, and bring a spirit of worship. Let's pray together. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, God, for bringing us to wherever we are, God, to hear this message on today. God, we thank you for your glory, your power, God, your healing wonders, God. We thank you for those you are healing, God. We thank you for waking us up in our right mind for the use and activity of our limbs, oh God. We thank you for doing all the things you have promised to do for your people on today, oh God. Dear God, we ask right now that you keep us covered in this current calamity, oh God. Will you keep us covered during this current time of crisis, oh God. And you allow the word to still make it out to your people, God. That they may not go hungry to you, oh God. That they may not go wondering of your love on today, oh God. We ask right now that everyone under the sounds of our voices on today, oh God, as the message goes out, believes and hears, God, that their mind might be changed and their heart might be changed, oh God, that they might be turned towards you in Jesus' name, oh God. We ask right now, God, for deliverance, for sanctification, and for holiness in us all on today, oh God. We ask that you come and you rest, rule, and abide here with us, God, now, henceforth, and forevermore. In your Son, Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Thank God and amen. Hi, guys. We are just coming to you guys to see... A little bit of a worship song for you guys. Um, take all mistakes in love, as my husband will be singing with me. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty.
family. This is Akila Haney Johnson and I'm representing the Johnson family, Watendi, Zacchaeus, Gabriel, and Gideon. For those that don't know our family story, we're spread across three different continents, which is especially hard right now during these times. We'd love to be able to see each other and be able to travel to each other, but we can't with all of the travel restrictions. But I know in my heart that everything happens in God's time and that there's a season for everything. So I want to share with you my favorite Bible, excuse me, my favorite Bible passage, which comes from Ecclesiastes 3, and it's verses 1 through Everything, eight. there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embrace, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. God bless you, Calvary family. We love you. Hey, Calvary. It's Sister Rivera coming to you from South Korea. Um, I just want to say I love y'all, I miss y'all, and I thank God for each and every one of you. Um, thank you for your, your prayers and your support and your help while I'm away from the family. Just a short testimony. Since I was supposed to be back from Korea already, well, I thought I was, and God had another plan for me. Um, just during this time, my emotions have been all over the place. I've been my patience, my faith, just everything. Nothing has been constant. Um, one moment it's like, yeah, okay, I believe God. Next one's like, hold up, God, what's going on? Like, wait a minute, I thought we were going a different route. But throughout it all, God has continued to um, build my faith, my trust and confidence in Him, letting me know that, yes, what you see in the news is, it's crazy, everything is crazy, but who's in control? God is. Um, and I just thank God that He knows me, He knows what I need, and He's always here and He hasn't left me and that he keeps me moving forward daily. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's a testimony just to encourage you all and just to thank God that even in the midst of everything, every, even in the midst of being over here, he knew that I was gonna be here. He knew, he 
plan and purpose everything and I just thank God that even though I don't understand he understands and he knows what he's doing so I can't wait to see y'all I can't wait to get back I love y'all greetings and God bless you I hope you enjoyed the presentation that was put on by the members of Calgary for our social worship our social distancing worship session um, we didn't try to recreate a Sunday service that you would normally see inside the church. What we wanted to do was uh, get into a spirit of worship that was relevant to the situation that we find ourselves in today. God is still able to work wherever you are. You may not be able to physically go inside the church, but guess what? You are the church and where you are, the spirit of God is there also. So today we're going into our fifth uh, session in our sermon series, God for Us. And the topic of today's lesson is going to be socially distanced, but closer to God. Socially distanced, but closer to God. What you got to understand is that we're living in a space and time where God wants us to be real with him. He wants us to be real with him. And that's devoid of any of the distractions, devoid of any of the schedules and programs that we normally find ourselves in, and devoid of the faces that we put on in front of people to prove how connected to him we are. What God wants is for us to be real in this season. He wants us to be transparent and truly connected to him right where we are in the condition that we're in. The doors of the church around the world are closed. But what I want you to know is that God wants us to open up the doors of our hearts because that's where the real sanctuary is. That's where uh, we can really allow him to come in. That's where true worship takes place. When we open up the doors of our hearts, it doesn't have to be in a physical building where God wants to be is right there in our hearts. And so it is there that brokenness can be healed. It is there that peace can enter in and replace sorrow. It is there that we can be safe and secure in troubling times, but we have to make room for God to be there in our hearts. For so long, we've been in worship services. We've raised our hands. We've shouted. We've praised. And we've done all these routine things week after week, but we have not allowed God to enter into our hearts. So God has us in a place now where we're socially distanced from all the distractions so that we have no choice but to allow him to enter into our situation if we really want to feel his presence. So we have to socially distance ourselves for a time in order for us to reconnect with God. I'll say that again. We have to socially distance ourselves for a short time in order for us to reconnect with God. That's what type of season we're in right now, a season where we should try our best, try our hardest, try with the most earnestness to get close to God. So our sermon series that we've been going over for the past few weeks is based on uh, Jesus's ministry on earth. Not only his ministry on earth, but also uh, leading up to the cross and then after his resurrection. And what we're doing is we're taking lessons that Jesus taught. We're taking examples that Jesus left. We're taking things that he did and we're using it to make it applicable to our lives today. And there's no better time to really look at what Jesus taught in scripture then right now, when there's a pandemic uh, that's pretty much causing chaos and mass fear across the world, this is the time when we need to do, like our first session said, and lean in on the word of God so that he can direct our path, so that he can lead us, so that he can be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so we've been looking at these different occurrences uh, that have happened in the time and the life of Jesus' ministry on earth and we're applying it to our lives. And so today, we're going to look at uh, our first, our fifth sermon topic, which is called socially distanced, but closer to him. Socially distant, but closer to him. And we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture 
from Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to look at verses 36 to 39. So if you have your Bible, electronic, um, paper Bible, if you're old school, or if you just want to look at the bottom of the screen, you should see the scripture come up. But we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to read from verse 36 to verse 39. And the scripture reads, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. So basically, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to go pray. I need you to wait here. You can't come with me. You wait. I'm going to pray. Verse 37 says, He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38 says, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So then again, we see Jesus tell his disciples, the three remaining, stay here and keep watch, but I'm going somewhere else. Verse 39 says, going a little farther, farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So if you have a highlighter, if you take notes, uh, if you like to mark down the important things that we're going to cover in the sermon, I want you to take a highlighter and highlight these two uh, statements that Jesus made. First in verse thir uh, 36, Jesus looks at the eight disciples. Remember, Judas isn't there at this point in time. So he has 11 disciples with him, three that he's going to take a little bit farther on. And then he has eight that he's going to leave here. So Jesus tells them, and this is the part that's important. He says, stay here. Stay here. Jesus tells his disciples, the ones that have been walking with him for three years, that have been uh, learning from him, that have been going out and doing the things that he gave them authority to do. He tells them on this journey, I need you to stay here. And then when we look at verse 38, even his three chosen disciples that he takes a little bit farther with him, he tells them, stay here. So the topic for today is stay here. There's some things that we have to cause to stay right where they are as we go closer to God. We can't take everything with us when we're on our journey to get closer to God. So sometimes we need to get into our vocabulary the phrase stay here. So here we are in this passage of scripture. The night of the Passover. The Passover meal or Last Supper as it's referred to today has been eaten and Jesus and 11 of his disciples now find themselves in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, when it's translated, means the oil press. It means the oil press, and it's often referred to as the Mount of Olives because it is a place where wild olives grow. And, and near that place where the wild olives grow, the Mount of Olives, the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, there would have been a oil press somewhere near that location. And an oil press is a place where fresh olives would be pressed and crushed in order to get their oil. Now, how ironic is this? That in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the oil press where olives are pressed and they're crushed, is the same place, ironically, that Jesus is there and his soul at this point is being crushed and press. Jesus is going through some things. But as he's going through it and he's dealing with these things in his mind, he's dealing with life, he tells his eight disciples to stay here. 
sit here as I go on and pray. We're in our time in our lives where a lot of us are dealing with things. We're dealing with emotions. We have things going on in our lives and we are hard pressed. We're in the oil press. But the good thing about an oil press is that an oil, an olive is not crushed and pressed for nothing. When an olive is crushed, uh, crushed and pressed, it produces oil. And oil is valuable. It's good for anointing. It's good for lighting a fire. So this place that God has you in right now, you're being pressed, you're being crushed, but it's not for nothing. God is going to produce something valuable from this season that you're in. And so he tells his disciples, sit here while I go and pray. And so perceiving that he was in a time of distress and that distress was coming upon him, Jesus takes to prayer. He doesn't just sit there and mope. He doesn't complain. He doesn't write Facebook posts. He doesn't post on the gram. Jesus says, I got to go pray. And this is an example that's worthy of our imitation. This wasn't a time for a corporate meeting or a conference call. But Jesus left eight of his disciples to wait where they were, right where they were, while he retired into solitary with three of those who were closest to him, to a place that was more convenient for his purpose. Jesus says this isn't the time for us to get together and have a big prayer meeting. It isn't a time for us to go and call the masses. This is a time where I have to leave the eight and go farther with the three that are closest to me. It wasn't that he loved the eight any less than the three. It wasn't that they were less favorable. But perhaps they were just not at a point where they were able to bear what Jesus was about to bear. It wasn't that the eight were less spiritual. It wasn't that the eight were uh, not favorable to him, but could it have been that they just were not able to bear what Jesus was about to bear? In this season of your life, there may not be enough room for everyone to walk with you on your journey to get closer to God. And it's not that they mean any harm to you, but they just may not be able to bear the baggage that you have to bring along with you on your journey to get close to God. Not everyone's able to bear what you have to take to God. And so you have to socially distance yourself from people who can't take what you have to offer. What you'll soon find out is that the closer you walk with God, the less room you'll have for anything to come between you and him. The closer you walk with him, the less room you'll have for distractions. So Jesus told the eight to sit here because I'm going to pray. I have some heavy baggage, some weight on me that I have to take to the throne room of heaven and you're not able to bear what I have to bear. So he left the eight and he took with him Peter, James, and John. Peter and the sons of Zebedee. He took with him not his favorite, not the most righteous, but perhaps the three who were best suited to handle what he was going through. The same three people that Jesus took with him would be the same that had witnessed him on the Mount of Transfiguration. The same people Jesus was taking with him on his way to meet his agony and his sorrow were the same people who saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
See, what you got to understand is that it's not always your favorite or even the ones who you deem the most righteous that need to be with you when you're at your lowest point. It needs to be the ones who have been there when you are at your most vulnerable and they still continue to stick by you. Those are the ones that you have to take with you. Not your BFF, not the ones you have the most fun with, but the ones who have seen you at your most vulnerable state and still stuck by your side as you were going through it. As you look around during this time of social distancing, while you're stuck in your house, as you look around, for most of us, God has us with those who are most suited for our situations. God has you stuck in a place with the people who are most suited for your situation. Your family, your loved ones, your spouses. Those are the people who God had you with right now. I don't care about all this nonsense that we see on social media, how we can't trust family and family are the worst. There's no one that's going to stick by your side like family will. If you need an example, look at mothers. A child can mess up and mess up and mess up. And no matter what, his mother will always be there for him. So you have to socially distance yourself from those that don't mean you any good. They don't necessarily mean you harm, but they don't mean you any good. And allow God to put you in a place with those who are most suited for what you're going through. So the Bible says that Jesus left the eight. He carried a little farther with the three. And as he was walking, he began to think and communicate with the three. Because these are the three who are able to kind of understand what he's going through. And he tells them that he's becoming sorrowful and trouble. You see, sorrow was not something that was new to Jesus, but this time it just hit a little different. Judas, who had been one of his closest disciples for three years, was off somewhere plotting against them. Peter would soon deny him. And the same ones who he healed, delivered, and set free would be the same people who would be protesting to crucify him in just a short few hours. Jesus knew all of this because he was the son of God. So he knew what was coming. And the agony caused him great sorrow. But none of this compared to the fact that he would endure the cross. And he would endure the cross as a sinless vessel. Someone who didn't deserve it. But in exchange, he would take on the sins of the whole world, including you and me. And so perhaps that is the thing that troubled him the most. Because he knew once he took on the sins for us, that there would be a period of time that the Father in heaven would not be able to look upon him. Because God is holy and God cannot be around sin. So Jesus was troubled. We have all felt sorrow before. But most of us will have to admit that this time, the sorrow just hits a little different. Some who are listening to this right now, you've been out of work. But at the end of the month, you're still going to be required to make a payment to bill collectors. 
There's some of you who've been faithful churchgoers, faithful Christians, but yet you're sitting there and you're wondering why you're the ones that's battling disease in your body. There's some of you that are stuck in relationships that you're not happy with, that you're not satisfied in, but yet you're wondering when God is going to make a way for you. And this time as you're going through it, as you're not able to endure the distractions from the outside, this time you're thinking about your situation and it just hits a little different. And this is where Jesus was. He knew what his purpose was from the moment he was sent here on earth. But as time began to get closer to his crucifixion, for him to take on the sins of the world and be separated from the Father for a time, it began to get real to him and it hit a little different. And so Jesus realizes this and he expresses it to the three that are there with him. But he understands that although those were his closest three, they couldn't do anything to help him. And so he tells the three to stay. Clearly, this was a matter that even the closest disciples that Jesus had were not equipped for. This type of pain, this type of sorrow, this type of agony, even his closest friends couldn't help to cure. Jesus had to take his sorrow to the only one who was able to understand the veracity of what he was going through. This time, in this moment, in this circumstance, was a time for him to take his situation to God. We're in a time right now, you and I, where God is reminding us that there is no one else who we can lean on. He, we're at a time where he's reminding us that we need a private audience with him. We need a place where we can get away from the distractions and be with our Father God. You see, in that garden, as Jesus was dealing with that stuff in his heart, while he was experiencing sorrow, while he was experiencing pain, he looked up to the Father and he said something that he couldn't say to anyone else. He said, my Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Then he said, yet, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was completely open. He was completely transparent and he was completely vulnerable even though there is a possibility that his request would not yield the results he hoped for. So we're at a time where God is giving us the opportunity to be open with him, to be completely transparent with him and to be vulnerable no matter what the results are, no matter what the consequences are, God wants us to reconnect our relationship with him. And what better time than a time like this when there's nothing else we can do, when there's no one else we can go, when there's chaos all around us, we can find our peace when we connect with God. So there's two lessons I want you to learn here. First lesson is that we're in a time right now of great agony. But whatever trials or suffering that's occurring in our lives, it doesn't matter how great the darkness is. It doesn't matter how great the pain is. Jesus understands what you're going through. The second lesson I want you to take away is, is basically found in Jesus' prayer in the garden. 
Jesus' prayer was straightforward. His prayer was honest. And we're no different than how Jesus was in the garden. So at those times when deep spiritual battles are at stake, we need to approach God in spirit and in truth. How lucky we all are that we're in a place where we can be face to face with God with no distractions. Where we can find our own secret place with him and be open. So today, if you're watching this, take this time of solitude and solidarity to just be open with God. Let him know what's on your mind, what's in your heart. Let him know your worries, your thoughts, your fears. And watch him make peace. I'm going to pray for you all out there today that you find peace even in your situation. If you're just dealing with being in solitude, if you're dealing with worrying about what the future holds, even if you're watching and you're battling your health because of this coronavirus or any other disease, I want to let you know that if you just find your secret place with God, he'll give you rest. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for everyone who may be listening. I ask, oh God, that no matter what state they're in, that you find them right where they are and you heal them, oh God. Heal their hearts, heal their, mind, heal their minds, and strengthen their souls. Give them peace and give them rest, oh Father, even in the situation that they're in. Relieve their agony and help to carry their burden. We love you. We trust you. We give you all the praise and all the honor, for it all belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you enjoyed this worship service uh, put on by the members of Calvary. Uh, we wanted to bring you an experience right from where we are. We're not just trying to recreate an in-house uh, worship service. What we're trying to do is uh, continue on with our spiritual disciplines and our spiritual practices, even from right where we are today. Um, so I want you to remember that even though we're socially distanced during this time because of the COVID-19, uh, that it's still because of your resources and because of your uh, donations that the church is still able to go on. One day, um, we're going to be released from our homes and and the places where we're locked down from, and we're going to have to go back into the actual building and have a church service. So let's make sure our buildings still go on. Let's make sure it still stands. Let's make sure uh, the lights are able to stay on and the, uh, the bills are able to be paid. So I encourage you to continue to donate um, through our online source uh, using the website Tithely. Uh, that's T-I-H-E dot L-Y. Uh, and just conduct a search for Calvary International Church of God in Christ. And we appreciate whatever donation amount you're able to give to help us. Uh, we're a small family church uh, with a big heart and a big mission. So we promise to uh, be transparent and uh, use your finances and your donations with the utmost integrity. So if you have it to give, uh, a donation of any amount to Calvary International Church of God in Christ will be much appreciated. So just download the Tithely app or go to Tithely online, conduct a search for us. Thank you, God bless you, and be safe during these troubling times. Peace.